in regards to anger, the people who feel and express anger and the various reasons for the production of that anger and the subjects who embody it, while the tendency is to think of anger as punctual or as isolated um, in time and space, it is historically, ideologically, socially situated just as much as any other cultural phenomenon. If the viewer of the show can make the formal and thematic connections, I mean, you know, just sit through the series and you know, do the research and things like that, and the series progressively shows how the apparently homogenous or discrete or the flat surface of a malevolent agents constantly breaks through into depth, into webs and structures and interconnect interconnections beyond that one individual's actions. Blame and responsibility still fall partly on the eight person as moral agent, but the question of the justification of their actions becomes complicated and non-individual. Coping potential is either absent, um, resulting in despair, or for some characters, both present and absent. In other words, um, the belief of some characters that they should be able to affect, that they should be able to affect change is, is what, um, that they should be able to affect change somehow is what actually increases their frustration. In fact, anger often derives from that very inability to affect change in the system. So despite your belief as a bourgeois individual, as a police officer, as a teacher, as a middle class, you know, upstanding citizen or something, despite the belief of these people that they should be able to just, of course, you know, I should be able to go in and fix things and you discover that you can't because, you know, these structures are, are you know, they're, they're, they're structures and processes. And this, this results in anger and frustration. Sometimes frustration, sometimes uh, anger. Um, so, from the beginning of the show, we are initially invited to identify with McNulty, about to say <laughs> something colorful there. But um, where, while the show ostensibly starts as a kind of typical pop series, um, it kind of does a big switch where we actually see that um, uh, uh, the outsider rebel a police officer McNulty, um, even though he's right in the critiques that he makes, he becomes increasingly frustrated and angry because he can't change those things. But it's not just McNulty against the, the structure, right? Um, Lieutenant Daniels, who is, you know, initially tells McNulty, is one of the first people to sort of chastise McNulty and say, chain of command, detective, chain of command. Um, uh, it, in a character like Daniels, we see an increasing decentering of McNulty's point of view and a proliferation of viewpoints, or um, narratological terms, vocalizers. As soon as, as soon as in the second episode, Daniels himself, who embodies like the institution for McNulty, is himself caught in a game in which there is no way to win. Uh, Daniels there, Lieutenant Daniels, as his wife tells him, quote, the game is rigged, but you cannot lose if you do not play. But Daniels is skeptical that there is any way out. In fact, Daniels is stuck between two conflicting goals, um, to advance his career and to be an ethical, just human being. If he follows his superior's orders to simply let the special unit die out in order to advance his career, which is one kind of goal attainment, he sacrifices an ostensibly larger goal of being just. I mean, either way, he loses, right? Um, and we see you know, more and more um, points of view. I want to skip ahead to one of the ways that the show um, particularly deals with um, season, um, in season four, deals with um, highlights the under theorized yet all too um, the all too prevalent phenomenon of the rage or the angry black youth um, of inner city poor black youth. Um, this season ex explores the links between the failures of the urban school system and the all too successful late capitalist logic of Marla Stanfield's new drug empire. Here, the young men who are angry have reasons to be angry. Um, as opposed to say law and order, where you know, or we just see the the, the criminals in the in the um, interrogation room, where are given fuller sketches of characters. So I want to look at Bodie, luckily. Bodie. Oh. <laughs> I, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So here. 
Preston Bodie. <laughs> the character Preston Bodie Broadus is played by the excellent J.D. Williams, and he really embodies a lot of the, um, the, the, the close relationship between emotion, cognition, and culture, and history. He's initially presented as someone who has just always been angry. Um, in season one, his grandmother says that when she took him in when he was four years old, quote, even then I knew he was angry. So he's just somebody's angry, right? But we see Bodhi develop from a low-level drug dealer, a 16-year-old low-level drug dealer in season one, to a mid-level lieutenant um, who only, you know, who works his, you know, his short, relatively short life, but is always loyal, only to be downsized when another organization takes over the street, the street market. Um, and one of the most poignant moments of the series takes place in the last episode of season four, when the character, um, uh, when he makes an angry and futile stand against Stan Spiel's drug organization. Bodhi's anger, he says, you know, this is my corner, right, running, is ostensibly directed at an, at an individual, but really the local drug trade and system, and more generally, the logic of the marketplace. Um, actually, I'm not going to play this since because of time, but I do want to play this next clip. Um, the scene where Bodhi is shot um, could be seen as one, I mean it is, it's one that we see in movies over and over again, and we see in the news. Um, it could be seen as just a sort of turf war of individual pathologized black male rage, and it is often portrayed that way, hence like the kind of warrior gene hypothesis that, you know, that, that gets, um, uh, uh, that's been getting some publicity. However, um, in season four of The Wire, Bodhi's fate is shown to be a part, product of the implacable logic of market consolidation and changed from an older Fordist model where sort of, you know, um, loyalty to a corporation results in, you know, a pension and, you know, your, fa your family being taken care of, um, to a kind of laid capitalist on what one scholar calls the McDonaldization of the street market, where the, the street dealers can become younger and younger, and you have someone like Marlowe, a Stanfield who is completely like who has no affect, um, and that's on purpose. Um, uh, oh, so his fate is shown to be a, a product of this sort of, of these larger changes. Um, this, these changes are undergirded by force that is more direct. I mean, there's you know violence. Um, you know, th and this force is more direct than the world of you know than the force say in business, <laughs> right, or in the corporate world, or you know something like that. But there's no less. I mean, but it's no less forceful and implacable in, you know, in, 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 in other uh, economic arenas. So, I mean, for, in fact, Bodhi's words shortly before his death resonate with the words of the out-of-work union dock workers in season two. This is the scene I want to play. I have the subtitle. We still in the city? It's still burnt Arborino. Come we come right up the hill. Which is nice. I ain't no snitch. I'm sure you were. Been doing this a long time. I ain't never said nothing to no cop. I've been out there since I was 13. I ain't never fucked up a count, never stole off a package, never did some shit that I wasn't told to do. I've been straight up. For what come back? Hmm? You think if I get jammed up on some shit, they'd be like, all right, yeah, Bodie been there. Bodie ain't tough. We got his pay lawyer, we got a bell. They want me to stand with him, right? Where the fuck they at when they supposed to be standing by us? I mean, when shit goes bad and it's hell to pay, where they at? This game is rigged, man. We like the little bitches on the chessboard. Pawns. Yo, I'm not snitching on none of my boys. Not my corner, and not no Barksdale people. But what's left of them. But Marlo, this nigga, his kind, man. They gotta fall. They gotta. Well, for that to happen, somebody's gotta step up. I do what I gotta. 